Okay. okay. By, by the way, let me, I'll do the intro here. Okay. So this is my style coach. You guys saw over the last couple of years, um, things changed for me as far as style went. I was dressing like a frat boy. I was tired of wearing uh, Under Armour and baseball hats and uh, long cargo baggy shorts. Um, <laughs> Andrew, because I'm one of his heroes, he decided to start also dressing like me. Now, <laughs> now, Andrew, Cam, some of you guys have picked up on this. Like, we try to dress our. It's a weird thing what we do, right? Right? Like, so we're professionals, we're executives in the fitness industry, and we're strength coaches. So I'm not going to wear three piece suits. That's not going to happen. That's not who we are. But how do you look relatively professional? How do you carry yourself the when you the way you want to carry yourself? How do you project what you want to project? And Tenor was a big place in that played a big part in that. And so we were, for years, we would go to um, a men's conference called Menfluential. I was like the fitness guy, you were like the style guy, we would talk and we'd hang out at night. And it, after like three years, I was like, you can do better on this fitness thing. And you were like, you can do better on you this You saw me got thing. pinned on 315 on a squat and mercifully <laughs> and we, reached out, yeah. I was like, you can be better on, you can get stronger. He was like, you can quit dressing like a frat boy. And I was like, well, I was like want to trade Let's go. Want to trade coaching? And he was like, yes. And so, He's now super strong, and now I wear five inch shorts, <laughs> and that's the way it works. So, Tanner goes the everybody. <laughs> that's a fun intro. Do you want me to clap? Okay. Um, I'm really grateful that I get to be here with you guys. Um, Matt's become a great friend over the years, and it's really fun to get to be in an environment. I was joking with, um, with Sully and Carl about this. You guys are really bad at fitting the stereotype of the dumb meatheads. I mean, we've done calculus, we've talked about metaphysics, we've done cellular biology, like we've hit kind of all of these different things. And I don't think that that's an accident um, because we're in a weird time in the world where the middle road is kind of disappearing. We find people stratifying and bifurcating to those who want to pursue arete and excellence and those who just want to pursue comfort and relativity and luxury and ease at whatever expense possible. And it used to be that there was this kind of balance back and forth. And you would find that there were people who had some of it here, but they still had standards that way, or they would pull some away here, but they still would aspire in other arenas. And sadly, it feels like it's just moving further and further in this direction. Now the advantage, though, is that you get the opportunity to choose which side you want to be on. Do you want to go towards this side of relativity or do you want to go towards this side of objectivity, arte, and excellence? And it's really easy to see this particular approach in a lot of different arenas. We can talk about how strength is better than weakness, right? None of you guys would argue with that one, right? You can talk about how kindness is better than cruelty. You can talk about how intelligence is better than stupidity. Nobody's going to argue with any of those. And you can also make the argument that beauty is better than ugliness. We appreciate beauty in nature. We appreciate it in art. We appreciate it in architecture. We appreciate it in our own bodies. How many just, and let me tell you this, this way, I don't like slides as much. I kind of like interactions a little bit more. How many of you guys have a pretty high frequency of clients? that initially come purely for aesthetic reasons. Is that a pretty consistent, more, okay? More so, recently. more so recently. What do you find, how, what do you find they end up pursuing after they get caught up in the beauty of strength training? Cause that's how I was. I first started training about eight years ago. I'm, I grew up incredibly skinny. In fact, one of my brothers rail thin in high school, his friends called him the two by four. And they called our family the two by forest because we were just nothing, <laughs> right? Like I, at, I think at my, at my smallest, I'm six feet and I weighed like 135 pounds, just absolutely rail thin. And about eight years ago, I started to get a little bit softer through the belly than I wanted. And I didn't fit into a pair of swim trunks that I liked. And so that's what kind of started my fitness journey. And I know for a lot of people, it starts that way where they just don't quite feel good about what they see in the mirror anymore or on social media anymore. And so that's when they start to come. But then what have you guys seen and experienced as far as the other things that they glom onto? What are, the, what are some of the other advantages that your clients experience? What are the other reasons that they keep lifting? Go, Sully. First thing I'd say is that the aesthetic yardstick changes. Okay, elaborate on that for me. So I think uh, their perception of what physical beauty is undergoes a metamorphosis with training. Mm -hmm. 
right? And they begin to look at, uh, at bodies and physiques with a slightly different eye now that they're actually immersed in it and they see what happens to their performance. So their idea that physical beauty and, and fitness is you know, a set of ripped abs and 6% body fat and bulging muscles, it undergoes a transformation, it undergoes an evolution, and they, they attain a more sophisticated and deep and real appreciation of what human physical beauty really yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And I would argue even the perception of, this, was, this is how it was for me, if I could go back 10 years ago and show me a photo of what my physique is today, that guy 10 years ago would say, that's too big, I don't wanna be built like that, which I know is comical in this room that I'm too big. But <laughs> the me of 10 years ago would look at that and say that, and part of it is because my identity was wrapped up in being a skinny guy. But then as you start to make more progress and you start to make these changes, then your identity along with your own aesthetic perceptions of what's ideal starts to change. Okay, that's a good one. What else have you guys noticed are the reasons that they keep coming, they keep going? Mm -hmm. So they sign up thinking, I'm going to get abs for the summer, I'm going to cut, I'm ready, I want this kind of hardship. Mm -hmm. And they realize that that's the kind of hardship to have abs, just be cut all the time, depending on the body type, really reduces the quality of life. And so then I think they change their perception of what their aesthetic goals are a little mm -hmm. bit. They start to enjoy their body and enjoy looking good. Yeah. They start to have more of a marriage between feeling good and looking good rather than just striving to look better. Right. Well, it is an amazing when you can see your body, not just for how it looks, but also for what it does. Because you stop existing in a world where it doesn't really do anything. Your fingers do all the thing. But instead, you find yourself in an environment where your whole body is what does the thing. And the way it looks doesn't matter as much because you love and appreciate it, not just based on how it looks, but also what it can do. Yeah, that's a really cool point. Go ahead, CJ. There's also the look of what it can do. There's a, it's a funny thing some of my clients start to say. They, they'll see a video review from me and, and I'll comment how much better it looks, how much more precise. You're grinding through and staying in the in the barrel with technique. And they'll reply, you know what? I look like an athlete. Now. Yeah. Like I look like I move like someone who moves. Yeah. And I've never thought of, I've never seen myself move that way before. Right. And can you imagine trying to sell somebody on that? One of the best points is you're going to watch yourself lift and you're going to think, man, I look like an, an athlete and I feel so good. Nobody's going to buy that. But once they're in for a few months and they see it, they have a whole different level of respect for their body and a whole different appreciation for it. That's awesome. Okay, Cam. One thing I've noticed, is the first thing everyone gets excited about, and I would, I would have never guessed this either, is everyone gets really excited about achieving mastery at the lifts. Mm -hmm. yeah, because they, they'll see that before they even start to see the physical results. They get really motivated of perfecting the squat, perfecting the match, yeah. mastering the lifts. Yep. And again, it's another arena of that arate where they were – unfamiliar with it but then as soon as they start to get a little bit familiar with it they decide hey i want to pursue this excellence in this arena as well okay how many oh go ahead Brittany. So i was going to say a sense of confidence especially in my lady lifters right just find a new new side of themselves that they didn't even know existed yep. yep okay so here's a question how many of your lifters how many of your clients would still want to hold all of those things if it meant that there was no aesthetic transformation to their bodies None of them, right? So we glom onto and we appreciate and we value all of these very real differences and these new things that come in and they're valuable. And at the same time, the aesthetics is always a part of it. Yeah, aesthetics, in the beginning, aesthetics is for aesthetic sake. Right. And as we go on, aesthetic becomes a byproduct of performance increase, quality of life increase, but aesthetic is always still there. Yep. It's just a byproduct of the thing we're trying to do. It's not the thing itself. Right. But again, I would point out that the aesthetic yardstick changes. It, it, so it does. They're not going to compare it to their old aesthetic. Of course. The wave right. in Calvin Klein model is not who they want to look not like. Not appealing they anymore. They want to look like the person who can perform mm -hmm. and have high quality of life. But the aesthetics is still attached to that. Right. Because right. they still don't want to look like the couch potato. Right. Right. The beauty is better than ugliness. That's beauty right. is better than ugliness. Right. And that that is a moral absolute that is a hierarchical absolute and it's something that too many of us are afraid to embrace and need to be willing to embrace more that beauty is something that is worth pursuing in our architecture in our art in our homes it's worth pursuing in our own appearance and it's worth pursuing in our clothing 
And one of the things that I've loved about what I've gotten to do over the last 10 years of being an aesthetics coach and being an image coach for men is learning from my own experience how well this supplements what you guys do as strength coaches. There's so much good overlap here. And as I asked Matt what he was hoping I would bring to the table for you guys, we talked about two different things. One is how this can improve your own quality of life. And two is how this can help you be better coaches and improve what it is that you bring to the table for your own clients as well, okay? So I wanna talk firstly about that secondary one. Um, and I love what Andrew hit on as far as the perception of ability and that integrity and then also how much you care. One of the things, okay, what do you guys do when your clients get frustrated because the transformations take longer than they would like? How do you respond to that? You're all chuckling, so you've all dealt with this. Tell me what you do. Okay, elaborate on that. Um, they're not losing weight, but their squat is going up. You just find something else that'll get them excited and distract them from the thing that they're disappointed. Okay, yep, yeah, really good. Object, right, give them the something right else direction. to point at, yeah. They're going the right direction, mm -hmm. and the aesthetics will follow. Good, okay, what else? Sell them nutrition cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Upsell, yep, yep, that's great. So one of the things that I've experienced in my own I've been anywhere since I started strength training, I've been anywhere from 149 to 200 pounds and kind of fluctuated and bounced back and forth in between all over the place. And one of the things that I've found is that your clothing really starts to fit differently about every 10 to 15 pounds. And you will start to see those changes. It happens much more slowly with your clothing than it does with what you see in the mirror. The problem is, is we, are, we see ourselves in the mirror for maybe like 45 seconds for Matt, it's like eight minutes a day. But other than that, like you really don't see yourself naked in the mirror other than when you're toweled off and you're brushing your teeth or something else. But we see ourselves fairly frequently when we're clothed. We catch a reflection when we're leaving, we see ourselves on Zoom calls. We see, we have this constant reinforcement of our own perception of ourselves. One of the things that you can do for your clients to really help them start to recognize that the transformation is happening much more quickly is get them in better fitting clothing right away, immediately, because it starts to immediately reinforce that the changes that they're making are real. And they're not dressing differently for a spouse. They're not dressing differently for somebody at work. They're not dressing differently for a stranger, but they're dressing differently so that when they see themselves in the mirror, or on a Zoom call or in any other environment, they're starting to get this visual feedback loop of I'm making actual visual verifiable changes in my life. Because it takes a long time for, those, for that visual feedback loop to start to happen with your physique. You can do it immediately when it comes to their clothing. I have been noticing myself commenting more on how guys look mm -hmm. lately in my feedback. I'm like, dude, look at that, your triceps. Right? Like, popping out or like, it doesn't look like, I can see your belts fitting uh -huh. better. Which actually, the belt is one of the first more fitted pieces of clothing than most of my older. It's the most have. unforgiving metric, right? Yeah. 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 Where it's like the shorts, the shorts say, down to there, but I'll the belt. Say, won't. That's right, and I'll give encouragement when they're wearing like baggy shorts. I'll be like, you know, you'll get a little peek at the quads and the yeah. hamstrings and the bottom of the squash, and like, bro, <laughs> you should get some shorts that are. Set You've earned so that off. teardrop. Show it off. <laughs> like, let's show those. Let's that's show those quads and hamstrings mm -hmm. off. Or like, hey. Like you're looking great, let's let's get rid of the, the Spider-Man t-shirt and let's get some fresh clean tees. And they're like, and then they do, and you're like, wow, it looks so much better. Absolutely. Right? Yep. And it's it it really is that's so much more powerful than I think a lot of us are even willing to give ourselves permission to admit. Because again, I okay, you can think about this on one of the most fundamental biological levels of visual communication is something that happens in the animal kingdom, right? And animals will communicate two very basic things, danger or sex, like that's it. Lions have these giant manes to make themselves bigger and more dangerous, or a puffer fish will fill up with water to visually present, this is not a logical thing, this is a biological thing because there's this visceral, re visceral reaction to if this is bigger, it's more dangerous. Or same thing with a male peacock. You notice that male birds are more often prettier than female birds? It's because it signals that sexual virility and availability and all of those variables that come with it too. What's cool is that people, we get both that like completely limbic lizard brain reaction to visual stimuli, 
but then we also get this very developed language component to stimulate. It's the same thing, you can talk about it from an audible term. A lion roars, and from that, from that reactive perspective, what do you feel? Fear, right? But if I say bacon, there's no reaction to it other than the meaning that is assigned to those particular sounds. There's not just the biological component, there's now the cultural component, the language component to it too. It's the same thing that happens with our visuals. We can make ourselves bigger to look more intimidating, but we can dress in a way that makes us look more dignified or more credible or more authoritative or more friendly or more whatever else it is that we want to be and start to tap into the fact that we're more than animals. We're not separate from that, but we are that and more to be able to start to communicate bigger and better things to ourselves and to our clients. Because ultimately, your clients don't just want to be strong. They come to you, and this is one of the reasons why Matt and I got along so well, is because so many strength coaches will make the argument that that is the top of the pyramid and everything else needs to be sacrificed on the altar of strength. The quality of your life with your family, how well your joints move, how well you can breathe, what your finances look like, everything needs to be sacrificed on the altar of strength. Whereas what Matt has done himself and part of what he's helped create and what you guys maintain as part of the barbell logic culture is that strength is not the end goal. It is one of many pieces that lead to overall quality of life. And so if you can help your clients see that what you bring to the table is not just the strength aspect, but ultimately you're aligned on that same end goal of what is your better quality of life. They're going to trust you more as a coach. They're going to see that you care more as a coach. They're going to see a higher perception of ability for you as a coach. And so everything that Andrew talked about goes up in that regard. So even simple things like, Hey, you know, let's, let's go a little bit short on the shorts. One, it helps me because then I can get a better idea of whether or not you're hitting depth, right? And two, like, dude, you've earned it. Those look so much better. I know it feels weird because you're in your forties and the kids in, in junior high made fun of you, but like, who cares what they think anyway, just go shorter on the shorts and you give them that little bit of extra perception of your ability and how much you care. And it deepens that relationship that you have with them as a coach. What else have you two experienced as far as being able to talk more about it and how it's helped your clients, whether that's them individually or what your relationship with them is? Uh, you know, you talked about like how much you posted videos in your training. I think people have, I don't think, I know people have recognized the posts I've made on social media and they're like, I've noticed the style changes. Mm -hmm. I've noticed the way you dress has changed and you don't look not you, right? And that was one of our biggest concerns when I hired you. I didn't want, I had this idea that a style coach was going to try to make me look like them. Yeah. Or like, you need to, all my clients need to dress like me. I figured out the part, and, and one of the things that impressed me the most about you is you, we spent a lot of time going through testing and surveys and similar to what we do at Barbara Logic to find out, well, who, who was I? And I think that was even sort of challenging for you because you didn't have a lot of CEOs of big businesses who were part of who was a fitness company right right where most ceos dress in suits mm -hmm. like, i'm not dressed in a suit but i even or you're not even like a tech ceo that isn't in a suit but you have to convey other things than they right. do That's right, right. yeah and so and then the clients picked up on that and i've had my clients reach out and it's just like kim was saying they'll start to ask about the style where do you get your shorts mm -hmm. where do you buy your shirt what do you do and i'm like this is you'll feel so much better in this mm -hmm. right or moving from like the like the tennis shoes to the white shoes, or the right. you know, or the what are the show socks to the no show socks, or so. Um, yeah, I think, I think part, the first part was leading by example, mm -hmm. the same way we do, just like the rest of you guys do in your Instagram or whatever. Leading by example with the lifting. I, yeah, I think that it's been a big piece for me. Yep. Yeah, I. Uh, there's that aspect of. Well, okay, so let's move over to this other thing because I think this is where this really starts to come in. One of the things that I've loved that I've learned just from listening to you guys today is none of you guys are one dimensional meatheads, right? I didn't expect that from you guys. I didn't expect Matt to hire anybody like that, but there's a lot of times the perception that that's what you are. Now, sadly for a lot of you guys, if I were to see you out on the street, I would have a one dimensional stereotype of who you are and what you're capable of, right? But you're not one dimensional. You're incredibly multidimensional. And I would make the argument that you have a moral obligation to present yourself as multidimensional, not only for everybody else, but also to yourself so that you don't become a one dimensional cartoon character. You don't only see yourself that way. And so this is one of the things that needs to be very important with your clothing is I want you to start thinking about ways that you can do 
and present more than just, I'm a strength coach, or I just want to be comfortable, or I'm still dressing the way that I did when I graduated from high school 20 or 30 years ago. I want you to think about how you can start to take all of these other elements of who you are and what your personality is and bring it out into the forefront and have that be what's presented visually. That's the same for women as it is for men. You don't want to become a cartoon character or a side character in somebody else's story. You need to be the fully fleshed out, multi-dimensional main character in what your story is. A lot of you guys were asking Cam why he has a stronger online presence. Part of it is that Cam does not present as one dimensional. He's got the physique, but rather than doing like, one of my buddies calls it like fascist gym teacher aesthetic. <laughs> but rather than doing that, like Cam goes to where he's got his grooming in a particular way that leans into the South. He's got the accent that plays into that a different way. We've got the loafers, which what kind of a strength coach wears loafers when he's coaching and right, exactly. And so it becomes multi-dimensional instead of one dimensional and it makes you much more compelling as a person. And then people will start to see things that they can identify with, that they can glom onto. And what's again, even more important is what you see about yourself. I think a lot of people make the mistake when it comes to their clothing is they think that it is 90% about what other people think of you. And this is where a lot of men get into, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I'm just going to wear what's comfortable. You know, well, that's stupid or that's what I'm not going to think about it because I'm, I'm totally confident and content in who I am. But it's not 90% about what other people think about you. It's 90% about how you present yourself to yourself. And when you- It's amazing the feedback that I'm able to give in online coaching, even though I don't feel, I don't, I'm not in the bottom corner of the screen. Mm -hmm. that as much as I joke about the fact that this job allows the opportunity to break down videos in your underwear and drink coffee, I don't break down videos you couldn't in do it. and drink coffee. I put on khaki shorts and the white shoes and a polo, and I bring up videos that way because I feel more professional when I do the thing. Yeah. You know, no one's ever going to see me. Yeah. And certainly I do the same thing on a Zoom call or something else. It doesn't always have to be in person, but even when they're not there to see me, if I always, if I have an important business call, I, even if it's just, I mean, and most of the time it's just an audio call, mm -hmm. I dress like a CEO mm -hmm. because I want to feel like a CEO. Exactly. I don't want to feel like a frat boy. Right. So I don't dress like a frat boy. Right. Okay, so let me, let me kind of pull an example. How many of you guys have done actual like powerlifting meets? Okay, most of you. How would you feel if rather than showing up wearing a singlet, you tried to pull in what Matt's wearing right now? But I mean, it's not any physically that much different. You could still pull heavy weight in that, sure. right? So why is it weird? Why is it different? Why is it so much better to pull in your singlet than it is to pull in a Henley and some khaki shorts? because of what the mindset is, right? Because of what it does for you. And you think about it from a lifting perspective. We do, we listen to our, our hype songs, right? And we go through, you know, I'll get in under a squat and I will stomp four times and kind of shit. Like we have these physical routines that we go through. You'll do your smelling salts. You do all these things that what are they designed to do is to get you in the mindset of doing the work and being totally present in that lift. Your clothing can do that just as much. This is where I'm going to argue with you about lifting in your jeans. I get it. I get it. And it's different. Like if you're doing a full workout and you're like really into it as opposed to just sneaking it in. Right. Cause when you really want to be present, exactly. You're not doing it in your jeans because your clothing can affect your mindset that much as well. And it doesn't just happen with our lifting. It happens with everything. That's why it's so important to wear. Yeah. Let's say you roll out of bed. And even if all you do is like, comb your hair and brush your teeth and maybe put on a pair of slip-ons or loafers while you're still in your pajamas and you're typing out and you're interacting with your clients, you're doing your video breakdowns on a psychological level for you, you are going to perform at a higher level because you've now shifted gears from sleep mode into work mode. It's kind of like, you guys remember Mr. Rogers when he's got the opening sequence and he comes home and all he does is like, that's it. That's it. To me, it drove me crazy as a kid because it's not even more comfortable. He's still in his, he's still in his button up shirt. He didn't even put on a t-shirt, but it wasn't about shifting to a comfort. It was more about shifting out of work mode and into relaxed mode. Right. And so I don't want you to only do this when it comes to what you wear, when you work out, I don't want you to do this only when it comes to what you wear, when you're actually doing your work. I want you to think about doing this when it comes to going out on dates. I want you to think about this when it comes to 
going to a worship service or going to court or traveling and going somewhere that's totally different. Like whatever you find yourself in, if you want to be more present in the activity that you're engaged in, one of the best ways that you can do it is dress in a way that is appropriate for that particular event and that particular environment. Okay. So I want to shift gears a little bit because what I've found as I've done this over the last few years, the last 10 years is that talking about it on this high level is pretty good and it can get you there. And then the question comes down to, okay, Tanner, so what the crap do I actually wear, right? Is where most guys go or where most people go. So I want to be able to answer as many kind of direct questions as I can for you guys, whether it's about fit or brands or anything else like that. But I want to be able, especially because a lot of times I can actually help illustrate the principles if we tackle some of the specifics with you. So who wants to lead me out? Who has questions about what you can, uh, what you can do differently with what your clothing is? What's a good first thing to start with? That's a good question. I would say the first thing that you can do is take the same clothing that you're wearing, the same level of formality and just simplify it. So get rid of any of the logos that you're wearing, unless there's a very specific reason for you to be wearing it, go to higher quality material, a better fit, and then more simplified colors, which is basically black, white, navy, brown, and gray. All of those work really well with each other. And so you get really versatile that way, but you're not necessarily going to be, Hey, I'm wearing casual stuff. I need to dress up and dress more formally, or I now need to have an entire closet of all these different shoes. Take the same things that you're wearing and just execute on them better by simplifying and getting higher quality versions of them. Yeah. But man, by the way, that change like for me, that was 80% of it. Totally. And I was very nervous about going to like church or family things, people who have known me for 20 years and go, I didn't want them to be like, this is what you did in the Midwest. This is the turn in the Midwest will say, oh, you think you're too good for your upbringing. <laughs> yep. You're too good for my upbringing. And I, I didn't want to hear that. Right. I, I wanted somebody to just be like, hey, you look really nice today. That's it. Like, that was the amount of change I was hoping in the perception of other people. Not, you don't look like yourself. Right. That was my, and by just like pulling the logos off the shirt, going to better fitting shorts, slightly shorter, slightly better fitted, right? Uh, tennis shoes that went from like Nikes or Asics mm -hmm. to just like basic leather, mm -hmm. white shoes. Those were all minor changes that sort of had a major impact, but didn't make other people perceive me as like dramatically different. Right. They were like, you still look like you. Just you a just better like you. Better. Just a better you. Yeah, in fact, Matt's a really good example of one of the guys that I can't use as before and after photos. I've tried it in the past with my social media to illustrate the simplicity of it. And most people are like, I don't see a difference. And that's a lot of times really kind of the point is you want it to just be the same you because you all already naturally gravitate towards a particular aesthetic expression of yourselves. Some of you are holding on to something from 30 years ago. Some of you are still trying to figure it out, but you all naturally have an incl inclination to try to visually express yourself. And so it's just about doing it better, not about doing it completely differently from what it was you were already doing before. Go ahead. About the fit, if you live in a place that's got sort of limited retail, mm -hmm. so you have to rely on online yeah. it, do you find that like you just find something that's sort of good enough and then you have it altered? So this is one of the beauties of online shopping, but also kind of the frustrations. Uh, you can think about it from an effort perspective and the effort is logarithmic in that it takes a ton of time and energy to find the brands that fit you well, that you like the way that the cloth feels and that it resonates and everything. But more online brands are going to cater very specifically to a demographic where if you're shopping at like JC Penney or Dillard's or Nordstrom, they have to try to appeal to as many people within that particular geography as they can, which means nobody's going to fit anybody very well. It's just going to fit everybody kind of meh, right? Whereas when you start shopping online, they will know that there is this particular niche. Like Andrew's wearing uh, pants from a company called Barbell Apparel, and they recognize that most guys who have big thighs and big glutes have a hard time finding clothes. So they built an entire brand around jeans that fit guys like this, right? You really only have a few retail stores. Most of it is being bought online, but there are so many online brands that will cater to whatever your particular niche is. So it's that logarithmic, you gotta put in a ton of effort to find the right ones. It means buying stuff, trying it on, sending it back, doing it again. But man, as soon as you find that brand, it is like printing clothing. It is so easy. Exactly. You just do it again. I mean, right. I have the same jeans that I'm on like my fourth pair because I burn through, you know, I, I blow out the crotch on them every two and a half years, but it's the same company. And as soon as I do it, I just buy the exact same thing all over again. 
I didn't have to leave my house. They just show up three days later. It's super easy at that point. So does that help on that? Good. Okay. Go ahead. Can you make me go through? No. No, but I would go to some of the brands because that she was recommending her online. I know you go into stores and it's a complete feces festival. Mm -hmm. That's a good term. I like that. <laughs> Little Virgin Ears. Uh -huh. They don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, that's great. I like that. <laughs> but um, it's trying to find these brands that fit that I don't, I mean, nine times out of ten, I don't care if I have a suit mm -hmm. or anything, I seriously get paid for a buy Yeah. Thinks, you're going to kill something. Gotcha. Just it out. And you don't want to look that way. I would like to look more that way. <laughs> okay. So what is it that you're... And this is, this will be a good example of an illustration that context matters so much. And this is again, very similar to lifting where it's like, okay, tell me the right way to do a squat. And it's like, well, if you've got freakishly disproportionate legs, like I do, it's very different than it is for somebody like Harry, right? Like the, the context matters a lot. Okay. So let's dive into this a little bit for you. What is it that you're typically in day to day that you feel like is frustrating that you would like to do better? Is it t-shirt and shorts or what's kind of like your daily uniform? Usually it's, it's t-shirt and, and shorts that I'm okay. in I work from home for both my jobs. Okay. Now, on my other one though, it is I am out in front of customers, mm -hmm. I am out trying to work with other companies to form partnerships. Okay. And so it's a tech company, so it is a kind of dress up business cash. Yeah, that fun like nebulous tech world of business casual where they won't tell you what it's supposed to be so they can weed out the guys who know from the ones who don't. Yeah, really, really fun, not pass passive aggressive at all. Yeah. Okay, what's frustrating for you about the way that your stuff fits? Is it in the arms? Is it the length? Is it how baggy it is? Is it the quality? Like, what is it that's frustrating about it for you? All of it. Okay. Because, I mean, here's the thing. It's, it's like, you, you know, it's just, like, you got long you arms. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. Super tight here or super baggy. Okay. The waist, they don't that stuff. Is, it just starts looking really small. So are you talking about button-ups or, again, T-shirts? Because if you're talking about length. Okay, for a button-up, honestly, with your build, custom. And what's cool is that custom has gotten to the point where the barrier of entry as far as finances and timelines and everything like that is not any different than it is to buy a decent shirt off the rack and then pay the tailor tax of having it altered and then it still mostly sucks. So there's a company called Proper Cloth. They do an awesome online version of, of custom stuff. Um, I would recommend that you start off with somebody like that. Yeah. When it comes to t-shirts, based on where you're built, um, one company that I recommend that's really good, they're called Buck Mason. Um, they do a really good athletic cut where it's got a good amount of taper, especially because this is one of these things, especially for us men, V tapers, everything, right? And a lot of times what you want is you want it to fit snug in the chest, the shoulders, the sleeves and the traps. And then you want a good amount of drape down through the waist and through the seat. And even if you're totally like shredded, shredded, you still want a good amount of drape because one, it actually makes you look more lean because you're still not filling out that shirt. And then secondly, again, it comes down to that multi-dimensionality. Cause if I can like see your abs through your shirt, it just screams this desperate, like, please acknowledge that I have abs and that's where my value lies, please. Right. And so you want again, more of that multi-dimensionality that comes through where it's like, I'm built well, I've got some size on me, but that's not the only thing that I've got going for me. So I would start with Buck Mason for shirts and then go with, uh, what? For the short sleeve, for the, yeah, for t-shirts and Henleys. Yeah, yeah. I love their short sleeve. They're not gonna fit you. No, but every time I go to the store, I'm like, I love Buck Mason and everything's built for like 150 pounds. Yeah, that's the problem is there, there anything that has a stretch like a t-shirt or a polo or a Henley will be great. Their button ups won't be as good. Yeah. Yep. You know, like fresh clean and true plastic. Yep. Okay. Now, I, this is fresh clean. I clean yep. them out. They fit yep. me better than the true plastic. So I would go, wait, come up. I'm going to use you as an example. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> You've been voluntold. That's all that's wrong. I'll give you guys a couple. No, it's not that bad, but I would, I think I would actually go down a size because one of the things you'll notice is that this shoulder seam here is coming onto your deltoid as opposed to sitting up here, right at the edge where it should be. You want the yolks to relatively match, like right where your bones are. You'll also notice that this is now coming down past the middle of your bicep. It's good that it's got the circumference this way, but it's better if it sits up here. And then you've also got more drape up here than, than you would like. And so I would say go down a size with fresh clean. And two inches yeah. shorter shorts. <laughs> <laughs> at least, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I just I just go 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 shorts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, shorts, bonobos are really good for bigger guys. Yeah, um, for the guys who are built a little bit more like I am, you can do really well with, uh, with J. Crew. Um, Harry's got on some great ones from Banana Republic. Yeah, so you can do a lot of those kind of simple brands are good for shorts. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Dan. I actually don't have a question. I have a recommendation. Yeah. You actually have a, it's, I'm actually actually, you actually have a really nice, it's like, maybe it went up, but it's $8 a month through email. Yes. He, he recommends five clothing items every month. Shoes, suit, shirt, <coughs> different companies, with links to them, and depending on breakage from your. Yeah, the archetypes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that a minute. Yeah, and sure. That test and kind of learn yeah. More. Yeah, okay. So. One of the, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make, and this kind of ties into the idea that most of us develop our aesthetic identity when we're in junior high or high school, right? Where that's when your appearance really matters because you're not your parents anymore, but you don't really know who you are and you're trying to kind of fit in and establish yourself with a peer group, like, I'm a preppy. right? I'm a preppy or I'm a punk or I'm goth or I'm a skater or I'm a, or I'm a math lead or whatever. And right. And so you really kind of develop this backwards relationship of, I find a group of people that I like and that's what my identity is derived from. And that's where my aesthetic comes from is what other people set. And that's perpetuated by the idea of like hiring a stylist to do the shopping for you and teach you how to shop or reading GQ and Esquire and them telling you what's in fat, what's in season this summer. It's this kind of starting on the outside and then coming in relationship with style. Whereas the real way that it should be is it starts off with who you are internally and it becomes an external manifestation of that identity and of those values. And so one of the ways that I've helped a lot of men over the last 10 years understand this is through breaking it down into three different archetypes. So you've got rugged, refined, and rakish. And really what these have to do with, it's how you interact with the world around you. Most of you guys are gonna fit into the rugged archetype where you thrive by primarily interacting with the world in a physical way. That's pushing weight around, that's working blue collar jobs, that's being outside, that's having this physical manifestation. Your clothing has function and it also has a certain aesthetic and a certain expression when you lean more towards that rugged archetype. Second one is refined, which has a lot more to do with understanding systems and hierarchies, bureaucracy, rules, the way that people exist, and then thriving by playing along with those rules. There's a lot of that. Matt's got a lot of that in him too, which is why you're wired to be a good CEO. You understand the rules, not only how, how you can thrive within them, but how you can structure the rules so that your entire company can thrive within those. And there's that aspect of it too. And there's certain ways that your clothing should be presented when it comes to that. This is where it should convey dignity, credibility, authority, self-respect, self-discipline. That may be a suit in the 20th century. That may be you know, big frilly lace collars in the 14th century, and it may be a toga in the third century, but those, those universal principles of dignity, credibility, authority, all of that can be expressed in very different ways. And then the third one is rakish, which is basically you understand those systems and hierarchies just as well as the refined guys do, but rather than thriving by playing with the rules, you thrive by breaking the rules. These are the guys who are like the rock stars and the rebels and the outsiders and the iconoclasts and for them, conformity is about as stuffy and hellish as it gets. And so they want their clothing to be something that expresses that individuality, that artistry, and that creativity. Now, all of us have all three of those elements within us to some degree. Again, none of us is one dimensional. And so the best style comes from knowing what your ratio is between those three and then cultivating it so that all three of those are expressed in that proper ratio. And then that comes into knowing how that looks because that's different when you run an online uh, lifting company and you're based in Springfield, Missouri, than it does if you run a roofing business in the middle of Wisconsin, than it does if you are a tech CEO in Australia. So there's all these other variables that come into play that you have to factor in. If you guys wanna learn more about where you fall within at least which one your primary archetype is, I do have a quiz on my site that you can take. I'm still working on this one for women. You're a totally different beast. I would love to figure out, I would make so much more money if I knew how to coach women. Because <laughs> I don't have to spend, with women, I don't have to spend all this time trying to convince you that it matters, right? <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's a whole different beast. Go ahead. I got a question. Yeah. So how, how much does it affect your, um, your clothing, your, you know, your, your, your wardrobe with the, the, how much your hair or beard changes in length? It's huge. Yeah. Asking for a friend. Yeah, asking for a friend. I don't understand why you're asking this question, right? Okay, so like with your... Exactly, right? 
So with your beard, that reads both very rugged and very rakish. And again, contextually, you go back to like late 19th century and it's not going to be as rakish because there were more guys that had longer beards. You go back to like 9th century Vikings and that's probably going to be very refined as opposed to having any sort of rakishness in it whatsoever. But where, where you are, the reason it reads rugged is one, because of the virility of having a beard and the fact that it, it goes that it grows that well, it comes in that full and you're able to grow it that long. There's the physical dominance that comes from that, that physical manifestation, that health, especially when it's juxtaposed with what your build is, where you're lean and wiry and very strong. And you could see it like even I was noticing the way that you're built when I was standing behind you, you've got really big lats, like you've got a really good V taper that sits really well. And so the beard helps flesh out some of that refinement, but at the same time brings in that good little go to hell middle finger because it's long and the corporate world of the 20th century says no way to that. And the current postmodern anti-masculine world also says no to that. So you get the benefit of it being rakish in the 21st and in the 20th century, which is kind of like a double dose of that rakishness. Does that answer that for you? Kind of. Well, because, <laughs> you know, extreme. Like, I, I don't really have much salmon colored clothing in mm -hmm. my repertoire anymore. Right. The way I could when I was clean shaven, mm -hmm. you know, 15 years younger. Um, I wouldn't be against it, but sometimes I'd put on an old shirt and I'd be like, mm, this looks really odd. Okay. You know. So I'm just trying to figure out how to fit in. I think you dress more refined. It's interesting. So you got you you got kind of like rakish glasses, mm -hmm. you got kind of rugged beard. Yep. But your dress is tends to be more refined. You tend to wear like well fitted shorts, well fitted jeans, polos, well you know, well fitted shirts. It's kind yep. of interesting that combo that I don't, and that would be my And favorite. I would also argue that that's ideal for you because one of the things that can happen is you don't want too many visual statements competing with each other because then again it does start to get relatively cartoonish and so if you're going to lean into having a beard that that's long that's that long your style should be, be very simple very dignified still very appropriate for the context which you really do pretty dang well um, but let the beard be the statement and don't have it compete with anything else which is why going with bright colors i mean it, right Right. And again, if you're going like full in, like the motorcycle gain, like the one percenter, then you can do all that because then it's not really individual statements. But if you're going too strong on the juxtaposition of I'm going to do this and I'm going to be wearing my, my Connecticut prep Madras suit, like the juxtaposition there is too strong and the visual competition of this bright patched multicolored suit against the beard is too strong. And so there's the context that comes in with it too. So if you want multidimensionality as opposed to just, Hey, I'm biker gang then do what you're doing. I would change the material. Cool makes awesome stuff. They're a Salt Lake company, so I like that. But they do the, uh, the tech fabrics and I would do a natural material like a cotton or a linen for your polos instead of doing a synthetic to help up that refinement and balance out the beard more. Yeah, go ahead, Zizia. Something I've noticed uh, between that and, and where you're coming through, really anyone who's kind of intentionally gone through this might have a response. But you personally, how do you balance feedback from other people and the intention that you're trying to get and how people perceive you and your self-perception? Because I hear Matt saying, you know, the, like, I wanted people to say this, not that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to convey this, not that. And then how do you balance that against, but this is what I want to say to myself about myself. I don't, you know, if they say something else, I'm going to be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. That's a good question. So there's a couple of things that come to mind with that. The first one is you need to know who your audience is and who you actually care about. I think we have kind of this false binary of, I care what everybody thinks about me, or I don't care what anybody thinks about me. And I think the right approach is people have to earn the right for their opinion to matter to me. I care what the right people think of me, right? So up until I knew any of you guys, you hadn't earned the right for your opinion to matter to me. If I had seen you at the Branson airport and you had a particular opinion of me, I wouldn't care. But now that we've built some camaraderie, we have shared experiences. I've grown to respect you guys and like you guys, you've earned the right to some extent for your opinion to matter to me. Not as much as Matt's does, not as much as my wife's does, or not as much as my friends at home do, but to some extent, yes. And so that's the first thing I would do is try and gauge whose opinion is it that I'm trying to gauge here? Is it somebody that I really shouldn't care about at all? Or is it somebody that they've earned the right for their opinion to matter to me? And then what I would look at it as is a balance here between the two, because as much as we would love to be able to have our cake and eat it too, you can't. And so sometimes you have to say, you know what? 
I know you don't love it, but this feels really expressive of me. This is how I feel my most congruent and my most authentic. So I'm going to stick with it anyway, or man, I really love that style and I wish I could pull it off, but it's going to totally polarize the people that I don't want to polarize. And so I can appreciate it from afar, but I'm not necessarily going to go with it. Does that help? Has that been your experience too, since he asked for you guys? My experience was that, um, there was, uh, when I first, I think the first thing I did was buy a Henley mm -hmm. and I put that on and I don't even know if I knew what I was trying to communicate. I just thought, well, this was like a step in the right direction. Right. And it has buttons. It's better than a t-shirt. <laughs> and then I was looking at a picture of myself wearing the Henley and I was like, man, now my shorts look and my shoes look really out of place. So then I felt inclined to go try a little bit shorter shorts. Mm -hmm. Then my shoes just looked totally out of place. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, now uh, I think I need to I remember you posting that on Slack, yeah, your so shoe search. It's yeah. almost like an LP of <laughs> yeah. uh, me, my opinion of what I look like more than mm -hmm. anything. And, and, and I don't know, maybe I was on some level learning to see what other people saw or just learning how, what I was communicating. And, you know, it's still a process today. I'm getting called out on my socks. <laughs> <laughs> Two steps forward, one step back, and it's just like each little piece kind of starts, keeps going a little bit more detail. The LP is a really good comparison because, you know, when somebody first comes in and they're struggling with their squat, you're not really going to worry about where their wrists are. You're trying to get their back angle right. You're trying to get so their knees don't come out too far. But if they've been doing it for four years, then you've got enough time and enough reps to be able to talk about, okay, let's get this right so that your wrists aren't hurting you by the time you're done and we can tweak it that way. And so it's the same thing with your style where you start with the minimum effective dose and you do it in a way that it becomes effective, but that often opens up the doors for you to start to see other things. And then what's cool is when it comes to your audience, as I would imagine if Matt were to now go to church or go to another event where three years ago, he was worried about people saying, you look like you've, you know, outgrown your upbringing, he's made enough progress that if he were to do something that three years ago would have been perceived that way, both for Matt and for the people that are around him, they wouldn't see a bigger change that way. Exactly. Because it's not as drastic of a change as what it was if he would have jumped yeah, there from three years ago. Where, 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 yeah, What's the first thing to change? Mm -hmm. like, go more simple, go more good, go yeah. better, better, um, you know, uh, better material. material. Yeah. It's not buy a green yeah, three piece that, suit. That's a minor difference. And then you can start to take, once you've gone there, you can start to take the risks. Right? Exactly. And my wrists are still small. Right. So it's like, you know, the Omega 1945 watch, mm -hmm. that's just like, and almost nobody will notice it, yeah. you know, but I'm not going to wear like the big leather, you know, wristband. I'm right. I'm not going to wear anything on my head. I'm not going to wear a big necklace. It's just not who I am. Nope. And so it's like, okay, nice watch, 60 years old, almost nobody will notice it. Has some story so to it. No, they'll be like, they'll notice. Mm-hmm. And it, it's that for me, like that's as risky as I'll probably ever get. Yeah. Is that sort of thing. Until you go down to Mexico and then you've got these awesome Aloha yeah, they, prints right, and then it's fun yeah, to lean right, into it that exactly, way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Nikki. I was curious if it's the same way for men. I found that you can try on certain outfits, pieces of clothing, and you'll, they'll make you feel uncomfortable. And then you'll try on one outfit and you'll be like, damn, I feel amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's not really about what you're trying to make other people perceive about you. You just feel a certain way about yourself. Yeah. yeah. And it does take on trying on like a lot of clothes that make you feel terrible before you find like the fit that makes you like just feel really good. Yep. It's, that's I think the biggest problem. Like it doesn't matter what I'm trying to say to people. Like I'm not trying to make them feel a certain way about me. Just that I feel a certain way and it feels like. I will tell you that that does happen with men, which is why they pick their clothes in high school and they wear the same things for the rest of their lives because they don't want to go through that experimentation process again. It's a security blanket and it's not a physical security blanket of somehow these are the most physically comfortable clothes, but it's a psychological security blanket of, I went through this incredibly uncomfortable process of trying to figure out what looked not bad on me that didn't embarrass me from my own perception and also what didn't get me teased by the other kids at school. I'm not touching that again. And what most men need to do is recognize that it's not just a random, like it, that comparison makes it sound like you just are blindfolded and you're throwing a dart and you're hoping it not only hits a bullseye, but it hits a bullseye on the right target. And a lot of people, men and women, that's the approach they take to clothing is they will just go in and they will try something or they'll hire a stylist and let them pick something 
Whereas there's a system by which you can think about this and it takes all of that guesswork out or 99% of that guesswork out so that when you do try stuff on, you get to the point where you're like, okay, not only does this feel awesome, but I can quantify and articulate why this feels awesome so that I, I then know how to add on to this and expand upon it and do more with it too. Yeah, go ahead, Harry. There's some um, essentials that you recommend regardless of the styles that you have, like the three you mentioned. Mm -hmm. like, some good basics? Yes, okay. So um, especially because we're in kind of like a post-formal culture where most of us aren't in suits or sport coats or anything like that anymore. Um, Henleys, which are, does anybody have a Henley on? CJ's got a Henley on, which is basically like a t-shirt, but it's got the two buttons on there without the collar. Yep, those are really good. T-shirts like what you have on. You can do a crew neck or you can do, who had a V-neck on? Some, I swear. Yes, Brian had a V-neck on. So you can do either of those. Um, a good pair of jeans. You want sneakers that are kind of like what Matt and I have on, which is not like your gym sneakers. The, the big secret for that is it needs to be a natural material like leather or suede. It needs to be incredibly minimal in its colors and in its patterns. And usually you want a silhouette that's going to be more simple, something that would have been popular in like 80s, 70s, maybe even back to the 60s. Um, you can do boots like what Andrew or what Nate have on that are kind of like a classic work boot. Jeans, I mean, that's basically it as far as like, those are going to be very neutral between the archetypes. Those are going to be very neutral as far as, you know, you could wear those if you are a strength coach or if you're a physicist, if you work in tech or if you work in politics, like you've got a whole spectrum of different environments that you could wear those in. And yeah, you're not really like leaning into those particular cultures, but you're also not totally separating yourself out as an outsider either. So I would start with those. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. It seems like what I'm hearing is that you usually dress your client to their personality, uh, their archetype that they've talked about, and less about what's on trend. Yes. I imagine, and I know a lot of these are staples, things that should be in stuff for a while, but I imagine there's still that need for a refresh maybe every so often, mm -hmm. right? Where they need to sort of cycle some things out. It's not like, oh, that's still 2019, but I right. imagine there are some, to some level, that you just... I don't know. Yes. I'm curious how much that plays into it. No, that's a really good question. Um, I think Tom, I don't know if it's Thomas Jefferson or George Washington, but one of them said, in matters of principle, stand firm like a rock, and in matters of fashion, swim with the current. Because part of clothing, it's supposed to change. It's supposed to be something that trends come and go, that things cycle through, which is again, like, that's why we're not wearing three corner hats and like putting our ankles out and calling it macaroni, right? Like it changes and it's supposed to change. Let me finish and then I'll hit you, okay? So the point is, the best way that I can describe this is when you're young is when you're in that fast part of the current of the river. You have all of this social capital, all of this like, energy, this thumos, all of this, and trendiness is good. That exuberance, that willing to try for both men and women, it's really good and you should be changing a lot. As you get older, you move over into a more steady part of the current. And so maybe it's updating on like a 10 year cycle or as you change careers or as you move to a different part of the country or to a different part of the world or you, you start embracing new hobbies or things like that. But then even when you get to your oldest, you still want a slowed down pace of change but still a pace of change because just like a river, you get leeches and death in the parts where it stops moving. It's only healthy where it's moving, even if it's moving slowly. And so as you get older, it should be moving more slowly, but it should still always be moving. Okay, go ahead, Sully. Uh, just a, a couple of quick points, so, uh, but they're related, and they're related to that. So uh, I went to this uh, retro thing, and it was all Batman, and I saw it, and I was like, watch, like, Wi-Fi oh, Cool. Yes. You know? And one of the things I noticed was, like, if I saw that guy walking down the street in that suit, he wouldn't look that out of place, except, of course, that he's wearing a suit, which is my second point, which is, I remember when people, like, would put on a suit to get on a freaking airplane, or if you went to a nice place to eat, like, people wore a suit and a tie. In fact, the restaurant might even require it. Mm -hmm. Everybody looks like a freaking scuzzle. Yep. Right? <laughs> but... But in terms of like getting dressed up, and nobody will believe this, but I actually, I actually love to dress up formally and to and to put on and to look like a gentleman. But uh, you, you guys never see that because I, I don't date you guys, right? So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but uh, so I guess my point is like when when I wear a, a suit, believe it or not, I I, I want to look like. 
almost looks sort of like timeless uh -huh. in a way. I want to have an almost sort of timeless look to me, like like I could have stepped out of a '40s movie mm -hmm. or a Hawaii Five O or something yeah. like that. And I have that look that doesn't it doesn't place me in a particular part of the 20th or the 21st century. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is when you look at your tea leaves. Do you ever see that coming back to where people actually give a shit what they look like, what they're dressed like in public, where people aren't embarrassed to go out looking the way that they look? Do you see that coming back? Or are we done with that? No. I think this is part of that stratification of society, where you will have segments of society that are happy to be completely overweight and breathing heavily after going up three flights of stairs. They're androgynous. They have no idea about objective reality or anything else. And then you're going to have another subset of society that believes in voluntary hardship, that believes in objective reality, and also believes in manifesting beauty in their clothing and in everything else. And so I don't think that we will go back to a homogenous culture where everybody wears suits or everybody wears something else. I believe that we're going to be splitting off into at least two, if not more tribes, where you will have those that appreciate dignity and want to manifest that in as many ways as possible, and the troglodytes. <laughs> Which sucks, but yeah. yeah. Sucks, but like that's in the phase that we are. Mm -hmm. it seems to be. I think yeah. it's manifest evil, but the, what do you do about it? Well, everybody sucking makes it easier for you to not suck. It does, but it, you have to be careful with that mindset because then it's, well, if all my friends can only, can only deadlift 95, then I'm killing it at 225. It's like, well, yes, subjectively, but not really objectively. And so if you use it as an excuse to not rest on your laurels, but to continue to pursue more excellence, then I think that that's a healthy mindset. Yeah.